So hi everyone, uh, greetings, a warm welcome to you all. Um, so my name is Andrew Witt and I'll be your host uh, for this In Conversation with John Davola on his new book, Terminus. And I suppose, you know, this conversation could start in so many places. John, you know, you, you've been working in Los Angeles for over 50 years now give or take a few years, which is of course an amazing achievement. And at the same time, you've created a, an extraordinarily diverse kind of body of work, right? That many other artists, critics, historians see as pushing, you know, the upper limits of what photography is and what it can be. But at the same time, I also see it as a, you know, a body of work that also simultaneously tests out the kind of the possibilities and capacities of painterly abstraction in the social field, right? And I, and I see Terminus, um, this new photo book that you published with, you know, Mac Books as a project that kind of activates these two strands. And I guess one way for us to, to you know, start this conversation is for you to maybe, um, in a way, just simply describe the project, Terminus, and how kind of describe the, the genesis of the, the project, how it developed, how it came about. Okay. Um, in 2015, I came across a, uh, a, an abandoned uh, housing area at uh, George Air Force Base in Victorville, California, which I live in Riverside, California, Victorville is about 50 miles uh, due east of Riverside, California. And it's sort of in the high desert. You go from where I live up through a mountain pass and you're up in the high desert and that's where Victorville is. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's in a little suburb of, of uh, Victorville called Adelanto, uh, which is a very kind of uh, unremarkable scrub desert and, uh, and at the time the Air Force Base was built at the end of World War II, uh, very isolated. It's still pretty isolated. The only thing really close to there is a big federal prison across mm -hmm. the road from it. And in 1992, uh, the housing area was completely abandoned. The Air Force Base was closed. Uh, the airfield is still operational as a logistics airport. But this very, very large housing precinct with a hospital, and uh, a still operating uh, school and uh, church are there, but everything else is completely abandoned. It's, it's now a super fun site because there was a contamination of the water, mm. by, I guess, primarily jet fuel and other industrial kind of waste. So since 1992, this entire area has been sitting uh, abandoned in the desert uh, and uh, kind of just deteriorating uh, through general entropy and, and whatever uh, weather takes place in whatever uh, criminals and uh, quasi-criminals such as myself photographers intervening and, and in some cases there in their case pulling copper out of the walls or in my case going and spray painting whatever so uh, if anybody knows anything about my work you can imagine my delight of finding an entire neighborhood uh, maybe a square mile of abandoned buildings and it was just uh, an amazingly, an, an amazing sight, not simply because it had this extraordinary history of, you know, the, the militarization of the, of the West, but uh, the desert West, but just what it was physically, you know, at one point they went through with bulldozers and mm -hmm. they like knocked over all the foliage and trees between the houses. Cause I think they were worried just a fire would like sweep through and burn everything. But they did it with such amazing disregard, you know, pushing the trees on top of buildings and crashing into buildings. So just so physically, uh, literally, the place is just an amazing place for someone like me. Mm -hmm. So I just started photographing there uh, just because I have a fascination with such places. And I photographed over a period of time in very different kinds of ways with different kinds of technology. I did a whole body of work which ended up being called Daybreak, where I would use an 8x10 view camera and just go in right at sunrise with the light coming in at a low angle and illuminating usually something I had painted. Uh, I did a body of work with a 4x5 black and white view camera 
uh, which I call survey, which are just general kind of survey images, and then coming back across some of the things I've done earlier. And at one point, I got very interested in hallways because there are these very similar hallways in building after building. These are triplexes and duplexes. And uh, just the way the light enters that hallway. And, and so I started painting uh, sort of just abstract forms at the end of the hallway, these kind of black circles. And very quickly, it became clear to me there was a possibility of doing something uh, that was a, an isolated project within this larger project, which is what Termas is, which is simply dealing with these hallways and dealing with sort of, you know, obviously a, a descending hallway has a has a kind of spatial relationship, and then a, any, anything sort of black form sort of comes to the surface of the print. And um, so I didn't immediately recognized that I, I wanted to make a project out of it. But once I started working on it, it became very clear that that could be a separate piece within this larger mm -hmm. George Air Force Base set of projects. And, uh, and so that, that was the genesis of, of how it came about. So those are all four by five black and white negatives. And you know, depending on the orientation of the building, depending on what the time of day it is, it, the, the light changes very much. So I'm not simply interested in the dimensionality of it, but I'm interested in the specificity of, you know, what kind of damage has happened inside of that hallway, what's kind of debris is there, and, and very specifically where the light is and what the orientation of the, that hallway is to the sun. Mm -hmm. yeah. And later I, I did several other bodies of work. I'm still working there now with a digital camera doing something entirely different. And part of this project too was, you know, I think you were also, were you not, you were reevaluating the vandalism series. So that, because, you know, Aperture was going to publish this three acts project. Mm -hmm. And so you were kind of re, you know, going back into your own archive and looking at those images for this, this, this publication. And in a way, I wondered uh, how, I guess, the latent, you know, the latency of the, the afterlife of this this project was kind of um, kind of resurrected or um, reevaluated in this new body of work as well, or if there was any sort of like dialogue between that earlier body of work and. Well, you're exact. You're you're absolutely right. It's like when I did vandalism, which uh, the the book, uh, you know, the work was 1973 to 1975. The book was probably in the mid 2000s somewhere. I can't remember exactly when, but I had stopped uh, intervening in spaces. I was just doing other kinds of work, photographing isolated houses in the desert and dogs chasing my car in the desert and other sorts of works. But in the process of doing vandalism, I had to go back and rescan. I had a drum scan. I, we have a drum scanner at the university. Mm -hmm. I had to drum scan all those negatives. And when I was doing that, it just sort of re familiarized myself with that kind of procedure. And it also, I also sort of recognized that the technology had changed in such a way that I could do things now that I couldn't have done before. Mm -hmm. So initially it wasn't at George Air Force Base. I, start, I started doing a body work, uh, for example, called uh, Dark Star, Dark where Star. I would go out in the desert and paint big, generally black circles, photograph with an eight by 10 view camera then go to the drum scanner and I can make these enormous like 45, 50 inch prints with incredible you know, fidelity that I could never make back in the 70s. So it was a combination of just having my, my brain colonized by the procedure of, uh, and, and recognizing new possibilities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then that is carried forward when I come into George Air Force Base in terms of that. But what's interesting also is that subsequently just a couple of years ago, I did a book with an Italian publisher, Skinnerbox, called Chroma. Hmm. And so in that case, it was color work from the 1980s that I'd done as zebra chromes. I shot them as transparency. So I had to re-scan all of those. And then I ended up about two years ago, three years ago, getting a digital camera. And for the last two years, I've been shooting and so the, this chroma stuff was colored flash. Mm -hmm. And I've been shooting colored flash 
with the digital camera now, which wouldn't have happened had I not had to go back and rescan all those transparencies from the 80s. So, those are now diptychs of you know blue and pink. So and white. One group of them is diptychs, but most of them is a larger body work called blue with exceptions, hmm. where I'm using primarily a blue gel simply because it interfaces with a warm yellow light, the ambient light that those two mix and counterpoint one another in an interesting way. So the majority of them are blue flash, yeah. So the, I guess, you know, the, with this vandalism, or not with Terminus, I guess, the, the project is predominantly comprises of these kind of large blobs or, um, you know, a circle, I guess you, know, you can describe them in various ways, but, um, and this is, you know, I guess a uniform vocabulary um, that's quite this also distinct from vandalism because vandalism you're incorporating you know grid like forms or um, you know, spirals um, also I guess like writing to a, a number of other non compositional strategies such as like you know I guess the monochrome um, but um, yeah I wondered why you, you decided to kind of pare back your your iconography to this it's like this distinctive um, blob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's primarily circular oval shapes in that kind of category. Um, I mean, there's there's two impulses. You know, I did vandalism and then I did uh, Zuma photographs. And I always was, I, I've always had this desire to be as reductive as possible which I very rarely achieve. And, and I often spin out into the more baroque in terms of, or, or cal, 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 calligraphy in terms mm -hmm. of marking. And so I wanted to be as reductive as possible, especially as it was back to black and white. And especially since I, you know, with, with, uh, with Terminus, you know, uh, I'm doing something that I generally don't do which is I was thinking of it as a book. Mm. And I was thinking of it as, okay, it's gonna be this kind of staccatic moving from further away to closer towards the end of the book. And I, I, I wanted a kind of vocabulary that was consistent from image to image, even though the shapes aren't exactly the same. Um, and I wanted it to be as reductive as possible so that it, so that wasn't about sort of the gestural component of my marking, like or or it being like calligraphy in any kind of way, but rather was was something that was sort of uh, countervailing the sense of spatial reading in terms of moving up and down this hallway, or and they're all different hallways. Um, so uh, and this this is something I always struggle with is that my essential desire is to move into a space and to be as minimal as possible in terms of my marking. But the opportunities often end up with me doing something that's incredibly Baroque and mannered. And, and I, but I just, that's the opportunity. And so I just give myself license to follow it up. So I'm always slightly disappointed when I end up with an image I like a lot that's very Baroque and mannered. Uh, because my 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 sixties art world, you know, default is always to want to be minimalist. Yeah. But it's it's always the gesture at the same time is it seems like it's emptied out as well. Even though it's baroque, it's um, it does not contain any sort of like you know what, like cosmology or no. or you know metaphysics. It's not a you know. It, even though they're, you can read them as voids, they're kind of voids that negate meaning in a way, is like they negate any sort of significance that go that maybe points to you also as like a you know artist. Um, but and it, what I find interesting is how abstraction attempts to reinvent itself within the social field by kind of negating this kind of earlier its, its earlier histories. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
which you know would tie it to autonomy or kind of the mystical or the you know the other kind of mythologies. Um, and yeah, and, and so, and I guess this movement is also kind of compelling as well, how you're moving through these corridors, because at the very end, it seems as though the, even though it does not, these, these blobs, these kind of, um, these kind of, you know, circular monochromes are also, you know, absorb and project light. And you can kind of see at the very last image too, your own presence as like this, as a kind of a shadow that's obscuring the light, the ambient light that's moving into the room. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I felt that that was, even though it's like, you know, the work attempts to kind of negate the expressive, it still contains the, you know, you. Like that, that earlier bo body of work was called Dark Star because I was looking for something that talked about that very element of painting something with wet black paint and it being reflective. So mm -hmm. I was looking for, like generally I look for a, a, a title of a body of work that's incredibly flat footed and obvious like isolated houses or vandalism or dogs chasing my car. But I couldn't find anything to say about that sort of oxymoronic character or something black yet reflective. <clears throat> so I ended up with Dark Star. As, 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 which was a far more evocative title that I would have wanted to try to talk about that. So that's something that interests me. But in terms of it being gestural, um, you're right. I, I don't want the mark itself to be evocative of, of, a, of a desire to be an expressive mark, but I do want the entire image in some way to be that. It, it, how that, how that, how that intervention integrates with the information that's already there in the and the uh, ambient nature of the light that it, that enters at that moment, I, th there is an an expressive intent, but it's it's moved back a step to the to the to the image instead of the the painterly gesture. I just wondered why why you ch chose the. Um... Terminus as a, as a title. Well, well it's sim simply that, uh, it, it, you know, simply because the book is about a, or, or the, the, the pretense of the book is about a movement or a travel, right? You're traveling from further away to closer. And at the end of the book, you terminate at, at the wall, right? You're like right up against the wall at the end. So, uh, and then, you know, it has obvious kind of, I don't know, emphasis on mortality, you know, and, and uh, a, a kind of metaphor for a, a kind of physical ending. There in Los Angeles, there used to be a, a cafe downtown, like in the flower, in the produce market called the Terminus, Terminal Cafe, which I always thought was an unfortunate uh, <laughs> title for a cafe. Uh, because it, it, it is, it's evocative of an ending, right? Uh, and, well, and I also, I guess, also geography, like the you know, like terminal city within, you know, like as like the end of like a colonial outpost. Right. Uh, you know, the, the last, you know, part of the, the you know, the, the frontier. Right. Um, and I was also, you know, thinking about the work's relationship to um, this, I guess, the landscape of, you know, Southern California, and everyone kind of associates Cal Southern California as you know palm trees, beaches, you know, easy living. Um, but at the same time, the, the landscape of California, but also like Greater Los Angeles, is also populated by all of these, you know, the um, you know military bases, um, you know, Air Force bases to um, barracks, military barracks to you know, and, and that, so, I, and there's actually a long history within, you know, photographers in LA dealing with this landscape of military Keynesianism. You know, this kind of the, the this, the you know, from Alice Akula's aerospace folk tales, untitled slide sequence to you know Judy Fiskin's own work um, of you know military architecture, 
as well as you know Mike Mandel, Larry Sultan's evidence is like a project that's dealing with the, the um, I guess the image economy of, of you know the Cold War, this Cold War, these Cold War industries. So yeah, I wondered how you kind of saw your work in conversation with this other kind of other you know bodies of work that kind of deal with um, um, this this issue of kind of this Cold War kind of the afterlives of, of, of a Cold War culture in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's, that's very complicated. But, uh, everybody you mentioned there, I know very well. In fact, I taught at California Institute of the Arts for 10 years with Judy Fiskin and Alan Sekula. And I went to school with Mike Mandel and I know Larry or knew Larry. Um, how to talk about that? I don't ever recall any of us having a conversation about mm -hmm. about that directly or about having a common interest in that the way the way i think i i think of it is is much more extended i i think you know if you're a photographer and you go out into the world and you make photographs where you are and when you are is is so profoundly imprinted into what's going on in, in what those photographs quote unquote mean or uh their significance. Uh, so, you know, I'm born mid-century, you know, uh, you know mid-20th century in, uh, in Los Angeles. My father was born in Venice, California before me. His, his father shipped out of, from a little island north of Sicily at eight, age eight, sold off as a cabin boy. His mother was, a, was from a, uh, a, an orphanage in Naples both ended up in Venice, California. And, uh, and my father, you know, after World War II, you know, they sent him off to college and he got to be an aerospace engineer, worked at Douglas Aircraft. And uh, although not on military aircraft at that point, it's, it's a little later than that. So, you know, I'm, I'm living in this place that's kind of bubbling and evolving and, you know, goes from, you know, California being 10 million people to now 40 million people in the space of my lifetime. And this enormous kind, you know, and it's the center of, you know, almost global popular culture with the film industry. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm sort of intervening, I'm sort of, you know, moving into these spaces and moving into these spaces. And, and you know, and I am more of an inhabitant than a commentator in a, in a certain way. It's a manifestation of my being and my moving through in my interacting and in and, and so I see the work collectively as, as some kind of manifestation of my habitation as it, more than my commentary or my passing judgment on it in in a certain way. And, you know, and, and obviously there's a terrible thing about the you know military industrial complex and what it's done to the desert southwest and you know like i said this place is a is still a super fun site it's completely contaminated um but uh yeah so, so you know i see myself as making this kind of huge integrated archive which uh, which is really complicated in terms of characterizing for me mm -hmm. and, and so uh yeah and I, I distrust language essentially, so I have a, I have a trouble trouble with that as well. But uh, yeah, so I don't think I'd answered your question, but no, no, it, I, I, no, it does, it does answer the question because I think it also, you know, whenever anyone asks, like, you know, any artist working in LA, they, you know, would like to read their work alongside, say, like the movie industry or, um, you know, spectacle of, of Los Angeles. But there's this other side, which is um, kind of the military industrial complex of military Keynesianism, which is kind of such you know, an integral part of people's daily lives, uh, or part, you know, especially in the 1960s and 1970s. Like the movie industry, it's kind of part of your kind of psychic you know, space and land, you know, it's part of your kind of everyday life, um, which is not as you know addressed as much and it's not obviously explicitly addressed in this project terminus but it's part of the material texture of mm -hmm. the work and the sites 
um, it's this longer kind of history. Um, and, and I guess one way to think about this is, is like obviously you're dealing with the, the you know the, a ruin, a ruined, a ruined um, um, kind of um, you know, base or kind of in, these interiors, but the interiors also are marked by these other kind of subjects, whether it's you know transients who are you know, visiting the, the the building itself, kind of making wounds into the building and kind of tearing out copper wire or um, you know, young kids, um, you know, shooting paintballs, you know, in usually site as like even stage war games. Um, but at the same time, it's so it's not like a, a ruin that's, um, uh, you know, it's not a conventional ruin, but it's a, it's a ruin that's kind of, it's marked by all these different other kind of subjects. And I'm, you know, also um, interested in how you rethink these kind of traditional aesthetic categories like the sublime or the ruin um and you know i you know the one even though it's and I, I i you know the one work that really stands out is the M, the photographs of the mgm backlot right from 1979-80 where you you know visited this um the mgm backlot in culver city just before it was about to be demolished the MGM backlot was constructed to resemble New York City in the 1970s, right? Um, during this fiscal crisis, but the site was also used to kind of stage, um, to be used, it was constructed to, for all of these kind of um, science fiction films set in the near future. Um, so it's, it's this really complicated weaving of these different times and geographies between Los Angeles, New York City, you know, the just past, the near future. And so I wanted, I wondered if you like you could talk about this, your 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 how your work kind of reevaluates these more you know traditional categories, um, like you know, the ruin or the sublime, and by incorporating, you know, um, by I guess I guess transforming them. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously interested in what all of these things are. I'm, I'm really interested in, in the back lot, what that was, you know, the, the contradictions and, and just what they are literally physically and then what they are and you know, what they represent. Um, and the same with, with the Air Force Base, uh, um, you know, in, in terms of, a, of being an artist and being interested in, 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 in the photographs being something more than simply a document, you know, they are dealing with ideas about gesture, right? And um, so there's the obvious gesture that I paint something, but there's also all these layers of gesture. There's the, the gesture of the person that designed the space, the gesture of the person that built the space, the gesture of, as you said, the, the, you know, the meth addicts that come in and pull the copper wires out of the walls, the gestures of the teenager uh, that are doing uh, war game exercises there for the military and shooting the places up with, with paintballs, and the gestures of the people that live there and, and left the marks of so there, there's these layers of gestures and my gestures are simply one within this array of gestures and I'm stepping back and kind of integrating these things into some kind of characterization or some kind of document uh, which has an aesthetic intention and a documentary intention. I just don't see these things as mutually exclusive. I think, uh, you know, I see my general disposition as an artist is being incredibly uh, promiscuous in terms of wanting to be able to collate a variety of different kinds of orientations and, and interests. And that's the beauty of photography is that it gives you, you know, that you can make a really stupid gesture and step back and make a photograph that's an interesting photograph of a naive or stupid gesture. Um, in terms of the sublime, I mean, I'm very interested in this notion of the sublime, and I'm and I'm interested in this this you know this you know the the way in which it it, it kind of sits on this nice edge between 
wonder and terror mm. in some way, you know? So there's something about abandoned spaces that are just in inherently uh, threatening, right? And, uh, yeah, and, you know, anything can happen. They're, they're kind of unregulated space, no telling who you're gonna run into. There's evidence of all manners of aggression in terms of the marks that are there. But by the same token, uh, you know, late afternoon, beautiful light, you know, pouring into that space, you know, you, you can get, there can be an incredible kind of beauty mm -hmm. and, and kind of counterpointing, sort of looking for this kind of isol oscillating edge between terror and wonder mm -hmm. is, is, is something I'm, I'm really, you know, after it's, it's unattainable basically, you know, but, you know, it, it's, it's like I always say, it's like you can make an image about the sublime, but you're not going to make an image that's, that is sublime. You're not going to make an image that's going to be somehow the equivalent right. of, you know, laying in this pool at the bottom of the quarry, looking at the moon at midnight, you know, no looking at some photo, it's language looking at a photograph. It's not, it's not the sublime, right? So I'm, I'm interested in it. You know, I'm interested in playing with the language of it. And I'm, I'm interested in the experience of being there. And, you know, a lot of it is like really uh, selfish. It's just the doing of it is, 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 is rewarding for me. We got another okay, a follow up question, which is this when we're thinking about the ruin itself, too, or, or even the sublime, there's an element which at times it does seem as though it's somewhat farcical as well, right? So when you think of the MGM backlot, it's a ruin, but it's kind of, the ruin, the ruin is like a farce. Um, or even isolated houses, those works as well. It's like these are kind of this sublime, this experience of kind of natural kind of wonder of the, you know, the high desert, these, these isolated houses, but there's something also quite kind of sad and somewhat depressing about these, these, these works as well. And so I wondered what you kind of also, you know, thought of this, you know, this, the, you know, when you talk about photography as a, you know, an act of redemption, what you kind of mean by this? Yeah, I, th I think, I, I don't know that I've used that term so much in talking about my own work specifically, but just more talking about photography. I mean, there, obviously, when you decide to photograph something, you have... Uh, you're making an assertion that somehow it has significance. It should be differentiated from all the things you don't want to photograph, mm -hmm. right? That, that somehow those those things aren't as interesting as this thing, and and so that in and of itself is is a kind of gesture of signification or, or, or significance or value by virtue of the fact simply by the virtue of the fact that you did it. Um, so. Yeah, I, I don't know that I think I'm redeeming anything. I, I mean, these are all interesting words. I'm, I'm just not exactly sure what to do with it. You know, it, I, I love this idea of the zombie, you know, in, uh, in, in talking about art, which, which is about a, a reanimating the dead, right? It, it, which is, a, in, in art, it's usually about some, somehow approaching the cliche, right? It's, it's like cliches are cliches for a reason because they're incredibly compelling. And so as an artist, you're always like coming up to this kind of cliche, like abstract expressionism, for example, for me, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm dealing often with a language of abstract expressionism and, and I'm kind of, but it's dead, right? It, it's an exhausted iconography. I shouldn't say that there's a lot of abstract expressionist painters out there still working away, but, but, it, but, you know, you're from the other side of the room, you know, other side of the museum, you see it, you, you know what it signifies, right? It, 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 a, a set of desires. Uh, but there's no reason it can't be kind of resurrected, you know, zombie-like, you know, it can be reanimated or recontextualized in some way. The, these, these, these things are kind of echoes, uh, psychic echoes or that, that you bring into the future. So, you know, I'm, so there, there's two things going on with me. I'm in a, I'm, I'm very interested in, in you know, in the, the art word indexical nature of photography. I, I, I go way out of my way to say, this was this date and this place. And, um, 
and sometimes looking in this direction. I'm, I'm interested in that and the fact that I've lived at what I think is an incredibly interesting time in an incredibly interesting place. I've just been lucky kind of where I am and when I am. Um, but I also carry with me this, this kind of cultural envelope of imagery and values that I'm kind of manifesting through the work. And, uh, and so this idea of, of you know, bringing something like abstract expressionism and sort of moving or just different kinds of symbolism that I'm kind of playing around with in terms of these spaces is, is, is not so much redemption, but it, it is a, a kind of zombie-like resurrection of, uh, of, of, of different kinds of ideas. But it, it actually it aligns quite closely to one of Alan Sekula's last essays, or published essays, essay that's published posthumously. He, I don't know if you're familiar with it, which is called Los Angeles Graveyard of Documentary. And you know, part of the essay talking about all of the kind of limits and barriers that the city of Los Angeles offers up to the photographic representation, such as you know, um, you know, the fact that no one walks. In, in Los Angeles, everyone drives. Um, and he kind of ends his essay by defending a set of artists, um, such as you know, Maya Dern, Ed Boucher's real estate opportunities as examples where of, of a type of zombie realism, a work that um, kind of speaks through these kind of these kind of an element of kind of ruin. Um, ruin and re redemption of kind of like the social landscape of, of Los Angeles, but also you know, speaks through these perhaps you know outmoded or obsolete forms. And I'm also kind of reminded of someone like you know Agnes Varda, who when she traveled to LA in the 1980s, also you know, made, you know, made this kind of amazing kaleidoscopic um, kind of portrait of the city um, through the kind of the murals of, of Los Angeles. And she kind of famously mentioned her work is, you know, attempting to speak through the cliche. Maybe to get back to kind of terminus, um, and you know what you mentioned about like you know when you're talking about like iconography. That I also also like to read. You know, these works also in a way read as you know modern icons without a type of you know distinctive iconography, right? And so you think of when you're looking at the actual kind of forms in terminus, they they do look you know, they kind of resemble, you know, Malevich-like black square, but it's even more, uh, it's emptied out even more of any sort of like, you know, Malevich famously meant, called his, his, his like, the black monochrome a desert, right? Which is, um, in this respect, is even, it's, it's actually a work that's um, located in the desert. But the one unique aspect of, you know, Terminus and these other works that take place in, this air base, this military base, is how the forms are always um, kind of transforming, or this is not, the forms are in a way improvisational. You know, when someone kicks through a hole into, you know, into the building itself. So that, you know, in a way the, the form, um, this kind of blob-like shape echoes these holes that exist in the building, but then someone also comes in and kind of kicks in the hole. As well, and even though it's this this a work that deals with a specific time, place, and moment, it also kind of it's it incorporates this this kind of you know a palimpsest of these different times and um, histories. But then, and I, and I wonder how this also relates to this element of time relates to the other um, like your works with the Gigapan as well, because this is kind of a unique project because. The Gigapan is, is a composite um, image of a number of photographs over, I guess, a kind of a territory. It, it speaks to an instant, but also a duration, which I find you know, quite unique. And it, is there also a few Gigapan images in this, this kind of body of work that we're showing? There, there are, there are. You know, I, I have a whole group of them. Yeah. It's hard to figure out what to do with them, but I, I have them, yeah. So, so what, what I guess for our viewers, what, what is a, I guess, to, I would help maybe to describe the, what the, the Giga, Gigapan? The Gigapan is uh, a robotic camera base. And it was developed by um, the same people that, that worked on the, the photographic 
mechanisms for the Mars rover camera. So, so the Mars rover doesn't photograph the whole panorama of the Mars landscape. It photographs little little areas, you know, like sequentially, sends them back one at a time, and then they come back to Earth and they're seamed together into what looks like a kind of seamless landscape. So the GigaPan is simply a, a robotic camera base where you put a digital camera on top of the, the base and you program it. Uh, and programming is too grand a word. You just basically tell it, well, that's the upper left-hand corner. This is the bottom right-hand corner. And you tell it how long to stay at each station as it, it robotically clicks along and, and, and scans the entire landscape in a, in a very uh, kind of prescribed way, perfectly overlapping every image. Then that is brought back into the computer and, uh, and seamed together into to a single image. And, you know, depending on how you program the camera, it can take anywhere from, you know, five minutes to 20 minutes to do this action. And you end up with a, a very, very large file. Um, to, to do this. It was originally, I think, designed, the first time I saw GigaPan was online and it was uh, the, uh, the, the first Obama inauguration. And you could just zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and see every person sitting around him, but then you would zoom out and, and you can go on Google Earth and there's like a little GigaPan radio button and it'll show you where people make GigaPans all over the planet, mm -hmm. you know, which are usually like picturesque spots and you can like zoom in. So uh, my utilization of it and, and several other photographers have used it uh, to make large prints is probably not what they had in mind, uh, but it, it does an amazing job of that. And so I used it a lot, but it, it's very it's very difficult uh, to show them because they're enormous prints and it's incredibly expensive to, uh, to mount and frame and put some really nice you know, non-reflective uh, Plexiglass on it's just thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's and it slows you down. You know, make a gear pan. It's like takes a while to, right. to do it. Yeah. And there, there's a few of them with you actually in the landscape as well. Whether it's your, it's your back turned to well, the camera I, or I, I, you're kind of facing the camera with like a pair of binoculars. Right. I did a whole series of them where I'm in yeah. the landscape with binoculars looking back, and then right. I I recreate as an earlier body of work where I run from the camera. Right, as far as I can get. Right, right. And I, I did a, a, a few that way as well. Are you, are you still doing that? As, no, as no, I'm 70 work? now. It's like I can't get far enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually 71. And yeah, no, it's like, yeah, I had this fantasy that I would do that and I, when I'm really older, it would just be the back of my head in the wheelchair, right? Uh, yeah. Four feet ahead of the camera. You know, it's, the, all those are 10 seconds. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah I, I wondered made, if there was the, um, yeah, if, if, if you, you could continue that body of work. Because, you know, even that first in the, the San Fernando Valley series, you where you, you're kind of running, I think it's you position the camera inside your bedroom and, you know, you release the shutter and maybe there's like a 10 second delay and you kind of run around the front right. of the house. Yeah. Right. Um, the, yeah, you know. I think that I'm afraid those days are over. At least that particular kind of gesture. You know. yeah. I don't see, I did most of those, even the black and white ones I did when I was in my late forties. I don't know when the last time you got out and ran as fast as you could was, but it, you know, it, it had been a long time <laughs> and I was, I was sore, you know, and you do that and it's like, you got to do it several times because you're not really sure, especially when I was shooting it with film. And so, you know, it was, uh, even then it wasn't so easy. And then the GigaPan, I was probably 60 something when I did that, mm -hmm. but I could still run fairly fast, but uh, not, now I would have to convalesce if I were to try to do it. You know. the, um, I, I kind of bring up this question because the, I also, I'm, I'm curious about this element of kind of aspect of embodied perception of, you know, you as a photographer, because there's, it's different to, um, you know, if to hold, you know, a camera, whether it's like a Nikon um, or, you know, to your eye, to, to put the, the camera, you know, close to, you know, hold it in your hand or, to, or you know, to use a GigaPan, which sounds like a, you know, a very cumbersome 
um, you know, object. And I think it's this um, determinist work is you know, shots um, with a large format camera. And so I also wondered, you know, and it seems like a lot of the work that's shot in Victorville is, is using these different technologies. And so I was wondering about like, if you had any kind of thoughts on the relationship to, you know, your, the, how the camera kind of changes your perception also of the, the site and the space. Well, no, it, it totally changes everything. Um, you know, it, it's when you work with a piece of equipment or, or a medium, I don't even think it, it's limited to photography. You, you internalize the vocabulary of whatever that medium is. And, and you, don't, you don't even really think about it consciously. It's just like when you're looking, you are looking through the possibilities of whatever medium you're using. And, and so it, it becomes just intuitive and, and second nature in a certain way. So if you're using an eight by 10 view camera, it's like, you know, you're looking at detail in a different way than you're looking with a 35 millimeter camera because that eight by 10 view camera can do something different with the detail. And, uh, and you're not considering spontaneity you know, mm -hmm. because you're not gonna be able to move around with that thing the way you could with a 35 millimeter camera so uh you know it, you just simply internalize that and and so even though i've used a variety of different uh cameras and equipment i'm usually using them one at a time right. um you know it's actually when i when i first started shooting color i would take out two cameras one with color and one with black and white and whichever camera i started with i would never switch to the other camera that day because my brain would just be looking through the possibilities of the first one, right? And I, I, I could never switch it on and off. Oh, now I'll do color. It just didn't, didn't work that way. So, uh, and now I'm shooting digital, which is entirely different, right. entirely different. And, um, and yeah, it, it's like, you know, I come home with 200 exposures. It's just unheard of mm. for, for me before, you know, with a day by 10 view camera, if I came home with eight exposures, that would be an enormous, number of exposures and expensive um, and the 200 and something cost me nothing with the digital camera and yeah. when I shot and I'm shooting these colored gel things with flash and when I shot them in the 80s with transparency film I would have to wait two weeks to see what it looked like here I see it instantly and I can change the relationship of these flash exposure to the ambient light exposure and I can try 20 different variations within three minutes, four minutes, you know, so um, it, cha it changes a lot of, it changes stuff, just uh, mm -hmm. what you use and uh, the material. Yeah, I there is a sense that the, the, there's like an, also an access to this because of like, you know, whether you're, you know, working digitally or, um, or even in analog, there's, you know, I remember looking at the, the second reprinting of the Mac vandalism series and seeing these new, Photographs and there's this, you know, sense that this project, whether it's vandalism or even Zuma, um, but you know, this recent body of work, there's a, in, you know, kind of going through your Instagram page, there's, there's the sense of that, that there's, that it's almost unending as well, yes, and, yes. and that there's this access, there's this almost an access of imagery, um, and for you know, a viewer, it's almost overwhelming, but at the same time, it's, you can see it as a form of rebellion against kind of photographic reification, whether it's like the unique print or, you know, unique form of experience or encounter. There's always, you know, looking at your work, there's always like more. Um, and it's something overwhelming about that, which is, um, you know, both exciting, but also it's, it's kind of quite um, kind of difficult to, as to, to deal with because there's also so much, there's so much. Um, and I imagine also that creates some, some sort of anxiety um, personally as well, perhaps. Um, well, to um, totally. No, this, this you, you, you put your finger on my, my dilemma, which is that what I see myself doing is, is creating extensive archives mm -hmm. of images. That I see this as my primary enterprise. Mm -hmm. And whether it ends up being an exhibition 
or ends up being a book, uh, ends up being a box of prints or a portfolio. These are secondary. The, the real work is generating this archive. Mm -hmm. But the reality of the way the art world works and the world works and the mind works is that you can't give people too many choices. You know, they, they did this uh, really great experiment I saw where, where they were selling jam at a farmer, farmer's market. Hmm. And they had two booths at both ends of the farmer's market. One had eight jars of jam with eight different variations. The other had 30 jars of jam with 30 different variations. Well, the booth with eight jars of jam sold twice as much jam as the booth with 30 because you just can't decide when right. there's 30 jars of jam. So I have a, a very vivid understanding of the problem, right? That if I put out too many variations, people would, you know, it, it's like you walk into an exhibition, there's a hundred prints, you're not gonna buy one. How do you buy one? It's like there's, uh, you didn't, you're never sure you actually looked at them all, right? So, so yeah, it's, it's a huge, it's a problem. And that's where books and exhibitions and curators are useful uh, and I have to, but like I said, I said, I use the word promiscuous. My, my Instagram thing is completely promiscuous. It's like, I go out and shoot and I'll, I'll put up like half a dozen photographs I shot that day on the Instagram thing, because, you know, I just want to look at them and somehow that puts them at arm's length for me. It like throw, it's like throwing them up on a wall in a funny way. And it's a way for me to it's like having a weird pirate radio station where you just like send stuff out, you know, and, and it's kind of enjoyable to me. And, and I see other people like me, I look at their stuff. And so I value it, but I know it's not useful for me as an artist in a career because it mm. does the exact opposite of what art is supposed to be. It's supposed to be like this Maybe. precious, oh, right. this, is, this is the masterpiece, right? Yeah which I just don't believe in that for what I do. I just don't believe that there's, you know, four images out of the hundred that are the masterpiece images. And I, you know, I guess this goes back to the, this aspect of um, abstraction and how um, you're able to kind of reevaluate, transform, um, and just kind of invigorate this, this kind of, this, you know, this dead language in a way. Um, by incorporating kind of these, you know, whether it's, you know, photography or these kind of um, interventions within the site. But I, I was also the, you know, thinking about um, this element of, um, you know, the reduction of your, your palette as well. So even though there's, there's an excess of imagery and there's um, almost kind of innumerable number of prints and photographs, the palette is kind of reduced to, um, seems in this book, terminus just um, black marks. Um, but this also, what, what I find this interesting is that you reduced as a way to kind of um, maybe re, you, know, re, you know reinvigorate again or rethink the um, you know this earlier body of work. But um, it's it's you know not going. You, you decide not to work in a palette that's kind of reminiscent to the Zuma series, which is, you know, using red, blue, uh, silver, spray paint. I know that you use silver in some of the other photographs. And what, what's what's next then? If it's, Will you continue to work in Victorville or? Um, I, I, thought, I thought I was done a year ago or two years ago. I, you know, I, uh, part of it's the pandemic, right? It's like, you know, what, you know, what an ideal place to go in a pandemic. Right? Mm. There's literally no one there. And when the pandemic started, like there was no traffic to drive out there and where else am I gonna go? So, um, and also they stopped patrolling, the guards right. stopped right. patrolling. So it, it just, it, it's, so, it's so nice now cause I'm not sneaking around. I just park my car anywhere I want. And, I go in and I got a, the, that digital camera and all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know, I worked with it for like six months. I couldn't really quite figure out what to do with the thing. And then all of a sudden I sort of figured out something I wanted to do with it. And 
So one thing leads to another and I'm still screwing around with it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what's next. Uh, you know, what I ought to really do is slow down and figure out what to do with, like all, as you said, this huge number of images that I have, uh, you know, I ought to like organize them or like do some shows with them or something. But I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't like any of that stuff. I like the doing of it. Right. So I'm, let someone someone else take care of it. Yeah, I wish that's what I really want. I just want somebody to just like take it all Thank and you. do something with it. I'm 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 actually one of the things I'm doing is I'm I'm sort of making an arrangement to put my archive somewhere. So that's allowing me to sort of organize and get things out of here and send them. You know, I look forward to seeing this other material when it kind of you know whether it's you know, presented on Instagram or in an actual museum and. It's, um yeah it'd be nice to see that you know in the flash um yeah so yeah. i'd like to see that myself yeah <laughs> great well thanks john all right andrew thank yeah. you it's uh, good to actually see you yeah definitely yeah yeah, yeah.